this is the third of the fourth uh, series or class within the Jesus series. Um, so this is uh, lesson three, Jesus is God. Um, you'll notice as you go through the notes here, this is really geared to a very international audience. So this was originally uh, created by Kip and Raj in India. And so you'll start to see that we don't meet a lot of the people this addresses. Um, but you can think in India this would be a study that you go, wow, this is, this is essential. So this is, uh, and that's how it's written. Okay, so basically the title is Jesus is God. This study introduces Jesus by showing how different he is from other gods and goddesses. He goes, hold on a second, how many are there? Well, in India, there are thousands and thousands. Okay, so you start to go to Asia and places like that. Jesus is just another God. That's why you'll study with a Hindu and go, yeah, Jesus is God, no problem. So they'll say Jesus is God. He's just another God with the other 2,000. That's what you have to address. So many from a secular world have a distorted view of Jesus. This study can be geared for Hindus by comparing Jesus against Hindu gods. In other words, depending on the audience, you have to change it a little bit. Muslims by proving that Jesus is not simply a prophet. So they would say, yes, we believe in Jesus, but he's a prophet. He didn't die on the cross at the last moment. Judas was replaced. And again, we can do another study on Islam. Buddhists by helping them gain the understanding that Jesus is far superior to Buddha. In actual fact, we don't know what Buddha actually said. It wasn't you know, written down until AD 29. Um, so nobody actually really knows what he says. Okay. Atheists to see that Jesus was God in the flesh, not just a good moral teacher. So a lot of people will go, yeah, Jesus teaches. Hey, they're great. They're moral. I'll follow those. However, it's impossible to follow the teachings of Jesus without prayer, Holy Spirit, inspiration and encouragement, as we all know. Christians who have never read and studied the Bible, which is the majority of people. In some nations, there is a widespread belief among people that everyone and everything is God. I remember the first time I studied the Bible with someone, and they just said, well, I am God. Um, from an Anglo-Protestant point of view, I was like, what? No, no, I am God, and you are God, and this table is God, and the birds are God, and... So you have to understand that that may be strange to us, but there are far more people who believe that than don't. Yeah. To refute to this, bring in the characteristics of God, saying everyone cannot be God, for anyone to be accepted as God, he should have these three exceptional qualities. One, God is sinless and flawless. Two, God has power over death. And three, God created something out of nothing. And the last time I looked, neither I nor you had those qualities. Colossians 2, 9. For in Christ, all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. In other words, when we look at who Jesus is, Jesus represents in character, not in physical looks, in character, God. Okay, the Bible teaches that every quality of God is in Jesus. Every quality. Jesus is the only person in any religion who has every quality of God. So when you compare false gods, you go, well, they you know, went and chopped people's heads off, and they went and slept around, and they went and did this, and they went and did that. Jesus is all God and all man. God is not an impersonal tyrant ruling from above, throwing lightning bolts at mankind, but a powerful God who cares deeply for his children. So we're going to take a look at a few characteristics of Jesus and therefore why he is God. Point number one, he has power over disease. Mark 1.40 a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. So gurus, pandits and so-called Christian healers claim they can heal. 
yet they do not do instantaneously like Jesus. They control the setting where the supposed cure is. Only a true God can cure immediately and completely. Anybody that truly had this ability during COVID would have put up their hand and just healed everybody. Would they not? If anybody had actually known anybody that had the power of healing, yet I did not see any ministers coming out going, it's no problem, I have the power of healing, just send me where COVID is, I'll go into Wuhan, no problem, leave it to me. Right? Whereas Jesus could absolutely have done that. Point two. The power to forgive sins. Mark 2 verse 1. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and they lowered the man the mat the man was on, lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? True statement. Down to Mark 2.11. I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. So to prove that he could forgive sins, Jesus healed a paralyzed man. He goes, I've just healed his sins. Forgiven his sins, what? How do I know? All right, okay. Well, I'll heal them as well. What you get? Come on then. To prove them that he could do it. Jesus is the only God who has the power to forgive, cleanse, and redeem you. Only a holy, sinless God can forgive your sins. No guru can do that. Why? Because it's just one man on another man. Point three, power over nature. Mark chapter four, verse 35. It says, the day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. That's a whole sermon there. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and waves obeyed. So Jesus controlled the wind and waves, nature. Actually, if you read the whole book of John, there are no parables in the book of John. There are just miracles because the book was written to prove that Jesus was God. Man designs computers, therefore he is in control of them, right? So you need to actually open up, switch it on, and do something to have something happen. Jesus controlled the wind and water as he was the creator of the universe. For Hindus, make it clear that we do not worship nature. For Muslims in the Quran, Muhammad did not perform miracles, but Jesus did. Point four. He has the power over demons. Mark 5 verse 1. They went across the lake to the region of Gesenaris. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name don't torture me. For Jesus said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. 
And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby, nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Many Hindus and many uh, people believing in you know, traditional voodoo type gods live in fear of demons and evil spirits. Definitely in Africa, this is still true. Jesus drove the evil spirits away from the man. Jesus has a power over everything, even Satan, so there is no need to fear. You know, that's the great thing as a Christian, you, people, you know, it, when Pentecostals go, well, there's a demon here, a demon here, and a demon there. You go, well, hold on, my Bible says, if you resist Satan, he will flee from you. So we really shouldn't be talking like that. The only way that demons are around us is if we don't resist them. Point five, he has power over death. Mark 5, verse 21 to 24. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat on the other side, the large crowd of the lake, a large crowd gathered round and while he's by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. Down to verse 35 of Mark 5. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told them, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and waving? The child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and he went into where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Tell her come, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. So Jesus literally heals a dead girl. Only God has the power over life and death. There's no gurus, no Muhammad, anything that went and tried to resurrect people. This is something very, very different. Only God has the power over life and death. Point six, power to create something out of nothing. And really that's, that is one of the greatest joys of being a Christian, is that we can create something out of nothing by speaking, evangelizing, creating churches, creating marriages, all those different things. In that way we can imitate that power, which is amazing. Mark 6, 34. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside of villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. You ever felt like that? You sort of go, God help me. He goes, no, help myself. Okay. They said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages, as we are to go and spend that much on bread and give it them to eat. How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they went down into groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. He then gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them, and they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve baskets of broken pieces of bread and fish, and the number of men who had eaten was five thousand. So, the situation here, there was not enough bread and fishes. So Jesus creates an abundance from two fish and five loaves of bread to feed and satisfy 5,000 men, as he is the creator of all. So these are all characteristics of God seen in Jesus. So the conclusion, no other person that has ever lived 
that has had or claimed to have the power over disease, over sin, over nature, over demons, over death, and the ability to create something out of nothing. So you ask them, do you believe? Do you believe Jesus is God? Do you want to tap into that power? And that's the short study. Um, I do just want to say, for a lot of us that come from a Christian background, you're going, yeah, you know, what, what, that wasn't, I didn't get anything out of that. Okay. You have to understand that when you're studying with people, this is mind-blowing stuff. Yeah. All right? Even somebody like an atheist come from China, and you try and teach them Jesus is God, or there's a heaven and a hell. It's like, Okay, if you say so. Um, so something like this, and really going through with them, okay, take your time. Yeah. Tailor it a little bit more, understand a little bit more, and then share your personal feelings. And I think a lot, share how, well, this is something that I prayed for. It didn't exist. God created it for me, and it came. So there's, add those personal bits in there. Does that make sense? And it's that way that the scriptures come alive more than just what I've taught you, which was very, very factual. Amen. Let's split up into groups, count out how many people. We must be pushing three things. Have you done all your follow-up? I've done absolutely every piece of follow-up yesterday. It was great. I spoke to Andrew Barber at length. I spoke to Abram at length. All sorts of different people. Got to have those 30 new contacts. Some of you go, well, I do a lifestyle evangelism. All right, well, I mean, somebody brought that up with me yesterday. I said, okay, well, how many people do you know that you actually haven't got their telephone number off? So we go to a certain cafe all the time. And these are my friends. I mean, I know them, but you know, I don't have any of their numbers. Now, if I don't have their numbers, then I can't send them the Christmas invite. So a lot of us have lots of friends, but we actually don't have their numbers. So in that lifestyle, go and get their numbers this week. And then the other thing is, please register for the January uh, retreat. I don't want to be chasing people down. I will, but uh, I really did it if you just did it, and then that would be great. Great, let's uh, break up the tribe To hear more from Dr. Joe Willis, check out his two books on Amazon, The Art of Spiritual Warfare, Practicals for Becoming a Prayer Warrior, and Money is the Answer for Everything. Click the links in the description below. Also, for more life-changing lessons, subscribe to his YouTube channel, Dr. Joe Willis.